you. Uh, I would like to give you a warm work welcome uh, for this evening uh, uh, for the lecture in the series uh, Die Qualität der Stadt, The Quality of Cities. Um, this uh, focus of the 2017 uh, lecture series is the performativity of the city, emancipation and integration in the urban society. Um, the lecture series is co-organized with the um, so Institute of Sociology of the TU Berlin, um, and uh, and it is uh, funded by the Federal Agency for Civic Education. Um, we uh, we also hope to be online, uh, and that the link uh, and the discussion will be streamed online. So it's also a warm welcome to everybody out there in the internet. Um, <laughs> this uh, the uh, the topic tonight is the uh, metropolitan narratives and integration in uh, in film, text, <coughs> and image. Mm. I'm happy to welcome uh, Professor Francisca Bolleray, uh, who arrived from from Delft, from the from the Netherlands, uh, to give us uh, an introduction an introduction on the concept uh, of the metropolitan narratives and the mythos uh, metropolis based on her book, uh, which was published in the year 2006, I believe. And 10. And 10 in English and German. Um, and it's a, it's a very intriguing um, collage of, uh, of different approaches uh, um, to the city as inspiration for filmmakers, architects, writers, and artists. Uh, professor Bolleray uh, um, is a professor of uh, history and of architecture and urbanism at the Faculty of Architecture at the TU Delft. Um, and at the moment she's also the, the head of the Institute of History of Art architecture and urbanism in, in Delft. She, she's mostly concerned with the utopian metropolitan, uh, utopian concepts, metropolitan metropolis of the 1920s. Um, and uh, she has been a member of uh, different, uh, of the different, um, uh, of different, um, <laughs> Um, different um, consortiums uh, and uh, cura curatoriums uh, of different organizations. Uh, one of those was uh, the Foundation Bauhaus, uh, Bauhaus Dessau. Uh, as well, she has held a guest professorship uh, in different universities uh, worldwide. Uh, in Zurich, I understood, in, in Holland, in Berlin. And she's uh, published a number, numerous books and articles, among others, uh, Cornelius van Esteren, Urbanism between the Style and Siam in Bauheld, Bauwelt Fundamente two uh, in the year 2000, uh, Building Culture in the Netherlands, or um, re a re-edition of the book Architecture Conceptions of the Utopian Socialists, uh, Alternative Planning and Architecture for the Societal Processes from the 70s and re-edition in the 90s and also other books uh, in the, in the um, English publishing house Rutledge. Um, now I would give over to Professor Bolleray um, we will have this introductory, uh, introductory lecture uh, and then uh, at uh, 1900 uh, we will go on uh, with a presentation by Daniel Schwartz uh, on a filmmaker on, this, on his way of dealing with the medium film in relation to the city and to architecture and then uh, um, subsequently at around 1930 uh, we have a discussion with other invited guests, uh, Birgit Stepanski and our 
pre previous speakers. So, Professor Baller. Um, I would rather have liked to speak to you in German, but I was told that it's not possible because uh, the whole uh, event has... Uh, is it possible to speak without the micro or you want the micro? Aha, uh -huh. so I need, it's always you have to submit yourself to technical uh, conditions. Uh, um, thank you for uh, your introduction. Um, you already had the possibility uh, to have a look uh, on what I intend to talk about, uh, which is uh, some really antipodic situations uh, um, with the topic for example, the gentle way of breathing, and then in contrary to this, uh, the <coughs> uh, obtrusive, the loud uh, uh, city, uh, especially the metropolis. Um, um, next. Before, uh, I really got interested in this topic, uh, how artists, writers, it's really being on a stage here with this, those spotlights, but uh, <laughs> I can't change. Um, before I got interested in the topic, um, Miss Metropolis, uh, how writers, photographers, and artists, uh, film directors uh, are interpreting the city, I was working with students uh, on at least uh, roughly 14 metropolitan cities. Uh, and in those days, um, we have been analyzing the city according to the metaphor of a human body. You see here some of uh, the covers uh, of the cities uh, we dealt with. Uh, metaphor human body means that, for example, the open spaces uh, would be the lungs, uh, the uh, sewer system would be the digesting uh, system of a city. And uh, treating and uh, discussing all those metropoli, I always encountered uh, the subjective um, interpretation of the narrators. And uh, before uh, starting uh, the uh, lecture, which is uh, a reading and uh, not a free spoken one because I'm using a lot of uh, quotations, uh, I want to dedicate, uh, and this you find under the title Narata Refero, I want to dedicate uh, some of my um, ideas uh, on uh, the expression of uh, the narrative. Since some years, the term narrative has become a very fashionable, has become very fashionable. It's used nearly inflationary, be it in political, be it in scientific circumstances. And uh, you always have to do with uh, certain uh, expressions uh, a la mode, uh, be it a hybrid, uh, nobody talks about hybrid anymore. So it's at the moment, it's narrative. And uh, I think one really has to analyze uh, why and uh, just some ideas. Um, um, obviously, city narrative, city narratives seem to have a more striking force than to just speak of talking about cities, for example. When we talk about narrative cities, we have to take into account, of course, that cities as well as individual buildings never directly speak for themselves. They have to be interpreted. For this, they need narrators. But the fixed Latin expression, narrata refero, which is the title of this uh, small piece uh, of text, means I'm just referring to narrated context instead of direct personal experience and interpretation. 
The latter process and creative action is what I will refer to in my lecture, tracing the many different ways interpreters of all kinds, be they writers, photographers, painters, film directors, are approaching the multifaceted phenomenon of the city. Before giving you a report uh, of uh, the respective uh, narrations, um, I would like to draw your attention to a rather recent topic, which is the commercialization of city images as well as the phenomenon of global urbanization. Those would be the two first topics I'm going to talk about. They constitute a modern variant of the much older occupation of mirroring the city in the languages of different arts. Oh, yeah. The forming of an urban image today no longer seems to be a process, although this image is rooted in the historical process that produced the symbolic and iconic characteristics of the city, of the metropolis. This image does not grow anymore, it is designed. It is commercial forces that stand in harsh contrast to a thorough reading of the products of writers, painters, and film directors interpreting a city. And I, I will show a series uh, uh, to illustrate what uh, I just have been quoting. You have the <coughs> subjective individual view, for example, of the iconic building of the Eiffel Tower by uh, Signac and Delaunay. Or you have the international Indian, uh, multinational uh, Indian steel concern, Mittal, using the Eiffel Tower for an advertisement, although it's not steel, it was, when it was built, uh, uh, of course, cast iron. Or other interpretations exist where uh, artists draw their fantasy from maps, here you have an interpretation uh, titled 42nd uh, Street compared with the real map of the fault plan of New York. Or again, the maps uh, you can see. A fashion design by Paul Smith with uh, the map of London or uh, Joseph Frank, architect of the 1920s, 30s, uh, uh, again, with uh, an interpretation of uh, Midtown and Downtown Manhattan. Maps for a long time already, already since uh, the first World Exhibition in uh, 1851, uh, have been a kind of souvenir. Here you see a silk scarf uh, of the map of London or what you still can buy today, a handkerchief, a cotton handkerchief of uh, Paris. The souvenir market, uh, the souvenir business uh, dealing with great cities uh, is uh, a very economic, uh, important um, uh, part uh, of uh, selling the city if you speak of commercialization of the image of the city. Yeah, here again, uh, you have the confrontation of the Statue of Liberty, the silhouette of New York, and uh, famous Heinz ketchup. Or you have uh, China, breakfast China, with the Berlin uh, uh, Falkplan reproduced uh, on this uh, China plates uh, and cups. The actual image of the city, its reputation, no longer derived from its factual qualities and characteristics. Features, although the former result, out of the latter. It is now shaped as marketing strategy for commercial purposes, like products are marketed 
on uh, are marketed to consumers, the city image is propagated to tourists uh, as another brand. Next. Uh, whether it is again the skyline, the skyscrapers of New York, uh, or whether it is uh, St. Petersburg, uh, the Admiral's Palace, uh, used uh, in this uh, specific case, together with a quotation uh, out of uh, literature, to sell uh, a specific wristwatch, uh, Swiss wristwatch. It is obvious uh, that uh, the flows of tourism uh, are not only heading uh, for the seaside or for uh, the ski resorts. Uh, metropolitan cities have become uh, a target uh, for uh, people to visit uh, the especially the historical metropolitan cities. Each European metropolis sports at least one or two symbolical power picks. Besides exploiting all the associations, expectations and hopes that are linked to its name, in most cases, a building is made a symbolic carrier of significance. Around the world, the Eiffel Tower and uh, the Eiffel Tower as a synonym for Paris, uh, as uh, the Brandenburg Gate stands as a token for Berlin, as does the Tower Bridge uh, for London ETC. Therefore, it is easy to understand that cities refer to architectural and town planning activities when acting in the political or economical field to strengthen their image. This game, in this game, metropolitan cities certainly have an advantage. Historical importance, as well as qualities of urban spaces, are deeply incorporated into their public image. They feed on the metropolitan glory that surrounds their history from old. Here are two examples, uh, two bird eye views, uh, um, which uh, show the uh, richness uh, of representative uh, buildings uh, in uh, metropolitan cities uh, in uh, only this time in Europe, in Berlin and Paris, and in Vienna and Budapest. Metropolis, uh, according to the etymologic derivation, still means town of the mother the special orbs uh, that puts other cities into second place concerning, concerning its role as model place of experiment, variety or multitude. Even agglomerations of cities such as Holland's Randstad or Germany's Ruhrgebiet uh, use the term Delta Metropo Ruhr Metropole, for example, they use the term metropolis to conjure up a positive image. Firms, offices, uh, or associations of all kinds like it as an escape route out of everyday provincial limitations. This is uh, the second topic, not directly related, uh, related uh, to the view uh, and interpretation of the narrators. Uh, I was uh, at the beginning mentioning that I wanted to talk about the commercialization uh, of the image of cities and uh, about uh, the topic of global urbanization. According to the insatiable hunger of mankind, 
to move to cities, migration has caused urban condensation and explosive growth. This uh, specific topic was uh, uh, the contents of the 10th uh, Architectural Biennale in Venice, uh, which was a really highly informative and analytical performance, giving space to the monographic presentation of many metropolises worldwide. So not only the United States or America, but the metropolis in uh, Africa, in India, in Latin America. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, was the presentation of Bogota in those years. To give you just a short glance of what happened uh, in Venice, I'm showing you uh, um, one uh, room in the... Uh, uh, Lana, this uh, gigantic uh, long building where the ropes uh, for the um, navy, Venetian navies, uh, was produced in former times. Uh, I think this was very interesting because it shows uh, condensation models uh, of uh, different uh, cities. Uh, uh, be it uh, Istanbul or be it uh, Tokyo. To illustrate this um, aspect uh, of uh, global urbanization, here to uh, other, yeah, uh, a, a French uh, uh, article of uh, out of the uh, Le Monde, which uh, speaks uh, of. Uh, Urbanisation galopante, uh, which is accelerated uh, ur urbanization, and uh, it gives you a little bit an idea of what we can expect uh, uh, according to the growth uh, of uh, cities uh, in the future until uh, 2025. Another uh, picture shows you the situation in between 1950 and uh, 2015. So you see there are really, in specific parts uh, of the world, densified, uh, urbanized uh, districts. By the millions they come, the ambitious and the downtrodden of the world drawn by the strange magnetism of urban life. For a century, the progress of civilization has been defined by the inexorable growth of cities. Now the world is about to pass a milestone. More people will live in urban areas than outside of them, which is already the case. More than 80% of the world population lives in cities. Does the growth of mega cities portend an apocalypse of global epidemics and pollution? Or will the remarkable strands of self reliance that can be found in some of them point the way to their salvation? The quote thematizes the attraction, the attraction, the magnetism of large cities as well as the threat and the dangers tied up in them, the bright sides and the dark sides of metropolis. Fascination and misery, apotheosis and apocalypse, these are themes that again and again, not only the positive aspects, in, inspire the imagination of writers, artists, film directors, photographers, philosophers, sociologists and historians. So now I am coming to the real interpretation. And uh, the first one is uh, the city as red. The city has turned the struggle with nature for food into a struggle of human beings with themselves that the profit people are fighting for here is not yielded by nature, but by people. 
Build your cities proud and high. Lay your sewers, spend your rivers. Work feverishly, sleep dreamlessly. Sing medley like a barbal. Underneath, below, the deepest foundations, there lives another race of men. They are dark, somber, passionate. They muscle into the bowls of the earth. They wait with a patience which is terrifying. They are the scavengers, the devourers, the avengers. They emerge when everything topples into dust. The apocalyptic picture Henry Miller can use here in Sexus could easily be used as a summary for Fritz Lang's film Metropolis. Or later, Bridley Scott's uh, Blade Runner. Critics of large cities see the metropolis as a barbel of sin and speak of a brutalization of morals and even the decline of culture. The shadow sides of metropolitan life were uncovered by a whole line of individuals from Louis Sebastian Mercier's Tableau de Paris to Eugène Sue's Les Mystères de Paris, from the dark sides of Charles Dickens to sketches and photographs by Heinrich Ziller and Kate Colwitz or George Gross biting documents. See more. So you have here Dickens, and you have Heinrich Ziller, and you have Kate Kollwitz. Poverty and crime are often treated as cause and consequence by critics striving for improvement, in other words, not so culturally pessimistic critics. Views that have been documented, though obviously against a different background, by Charles Chaplin, in the form of a parody in his film The Kid or City Lights, or even before that by the New York photographer Jacob R. Rice in his book How the Other Half Lives, published uh, already in 1929. And uh, to give this uh, historic view and actual um, interpretation, I have uh, chosen uh, two uh, antipodic uh, vistas of uh, this uh, uh, multi-headed uh, situation of uh, the needy and uh, the affluent. Um, uh, you have here uh, people, young young boys in Africa, and uh, you have what uh, is offered uh, in the fashion magazines, uh, sneakers for uh, 200 or even more uh, euros or dollars. Uh, another antipodic uh, uh, vision, yeah, with uh, the very, very expensive handbags. Disparities that mirror the global gap between the privileged and the needy and can be observed in spatial vicinity to each other in great cities. For the great cities, O oh Lord, are lost and stray. The greatest is no more than the flight from flames. And it is no comfort that he should comfort them and watch over their short time. People live there and live hard and badly, wrote Rainer Maria Rilke already in 1903. In Oswald Spengler's popular and controversial work, Der Untergang des Abendlandes, Umrisse einer Morphologie der Weltgeschichte, English translation, the decline of the West, outline of a morphology of world history, written between 1918 and 1922, Degeneration and decay are also alleged as phenomena in the decadence of the big city, the metropolis. The stone colossus of a metropolis stands at the end of the life of every great culture. But he, Spengler, has to concede at the same time that 
quotations finger, anyone who has ever fallen for the bold, sinful beauty of this last wonder of history can never again free himself. Homesickness for a big city is perhaps stronger than any other. This homesickness, or is this homesickness for, or better, identification with the metropolis we already encounter in the 19th century with Christian Friedrich Heppel. Yeah. I really like being in Paris. I can't understand how there can have been people who didn't like being here. I would like to stay here for years, for a lifetime, and I am horrified by the thought of leaving. One sails on a different current. Paris isn't a city, but rather a world. No other place on earth has so much of the world in one place. It is enough to drive to distraction anyone who means to grasp everything and turn it to his advantage. Whenever I wander through the streets or enter one of these world famous buildings, I feel at once proud and humiliated. And I often shout out loud, I am happy. Paris will always be the center of my desires. Or a century later, when I arrived in Paris, I was finally able to express my somewhat heavenly joy. In Paris, I finally had a vision of what I wanted to achieve. It was there that I discovered a new psychical dimension to my painting and knew that that was where my home was, wrote Marc Chagall. The social body of the old grand metropoly of Europe embraced the spiritual, technical, and social demands of the century with an open-mindedness born of the wisdom of experience nurtured during hundreds of years of urban tradition. Among these, the citizens of Berlin met these demands immediately and directly. Lacking experience, they blindly embraced the new. They collided with the century. Berlin city painting is a representation of this collision. Wim Wenders uh, commented this collision years later, of course, I need the city as a condition of my existence. I have everything I need physically and mentally in the city around me. And uh, in an interview, find, my city, uh, find myself a city to live in. To him, this was Berlin. To others, it's New York, Paris, London, Tokyo, uh, or other metropoli. Uh, or very big cities. Before interpreting Wim Wenders' Act of Seeing, a title of a collection of essays written by him, it seems opportune to quote Georg Simmel on the mental conditions uh, in big cities as a survival technique. I'm quoting uh, Simmel. Persistently occurring impressions with negligible differences between them and with habitual regularity in their cause and their contrast demand, so to speak, less consciousness than the sudden convergence of differing images. The harsh contrast marking what can be seen at a single glance, the unexpectedness of oncoming impres impressions. In providing these psychological conditions uh, with every step taken across the street, with the speed and variety of commercial, professional, social life, it establishes deep down in the material foundations of mental life uh, 
in the quantity of consciousness it demands from us because of our organization as distinguishing beings, a profound contrast to small town or country life with its slower, more routine, steadier flowing rhythm of mental life. Thus, the intellectual character of big city life begins to be comprehensible. This, <coughs> as already mentioned, uh, this analytical description is mirrored in the form of snapshots uh, in the art production of the 1920s uh, in Berlin. Um, as already announced, uh, I'm now uh, trying to talk uh, about one uh, specific interpretation of the big city, which is not the loud and obtrusive city, but uh, the city where, as you are strolling through it, uh, as Baudelaire, for example, did, uh, you have to take your time. In a paper presented to Japanese architects, the Wim Wenders pleads for stasis rather than city repair at any price. Contemplative rather than affirmative planning correlates with his ideal vision of the city. There must be room for pauses. Pauses for an optical breather, for reflection, for making sense, for digestion, for suggestion. Next. Some pictures uh, to illustrate uh, for when you are strolling through the city that you have to take your time to look and find uh, those uh, situations which are described as uh, poses uh, by uh, Wim Wenders. I'm continuing um, to quote Wenders. Uh, and I want you to consider the opposite of what is by definition your work, not only the construction of buildings, but the creation of spaces. We must avoid cluttering our view and preserve emptiness as space for respite. And he continues, we must fight to preserve everything small that still remains. The small puts the big into perspective. In a, small, uh, in a city, the small, the empty, and the open are the batteries that allow us to recharge, that protect us from the overpowering influence of the big. When this film, The Wings of Desire, would have been unthinkable without the significance of uh, space. On another occasion, Wenders remarks, uh, I'm sure that these firewalls have a much stronger effect on memory than the painted facades. The broken engraves itself on the mind much more clearly than the intact. In a manner of speaking, the broken supplies surfaces where memory can take hold. Memory slides off the clean surfaces of the intact. Here we are dealing with a cityscape whose meaning is nurtured not merely by its many monuments or by its one unmistakable monument, but rather by an image that is an exercise in reading. The wall that speaks. I do not know whether I have already said that it is this wall, I mean, writes Rainer Maria Rilke, 
in the notebooks of Malte Lauritz Brigham. One saw its inner side, one saw at the different stories the walls of the rooms to which the papers still clung, and here and there marks of the beams of flooring and ceiling. Near the room portions there still remained along the whole length of the wall a grayish white streak across this there crept in warm like spirals that seemed to serve some unspeakable disgusting digestive function the gaping rust covered channel of the water clothed pipe one could see it in the colors which had slowly changed year by year and from these walls, once blue and green and yellow, framed by the tracks of the disturbed portions, the breath of, the li of these lives came forth. The clammy, sluggish, fusty breath, which no wind had yet scattered. There were the midday meals and the sicknesses and the exhalations and the smoke of years and the sweat that breaks out under the armpits and makes the garments heavy and the stale breath of mouths and the only odor of perspiring feet. There were the pungent tang of urine and the stench of burning soot and the gray reek of potatoes and the heavy sickly fumes of rancid grease and more that had oozed down from above with the rain which over cities is not clear. And much more was there, the sources of which were not known I said, did I not, that all the walls had been demolished except the last. It is of this wall I have been speaking all along. In complete contrast uh, to this sorely associative piece of literature is the attempt uh, to conquer the loud and obtrusive city. Art attempts to consign the industrial world with its altered processes of production back into place by employing its own methods. The alliance through alienation by means of a montage of heterodox elements is thus placed in a new context. At the same time, art requires of anyone approaching it a readiness and the effort required for a new way of reading. The aim here is an effect of discontinuity, a granting of meaning which removes the incompatible materials from their original and functional relationship in order to unite them in a new entity by means of an artistic treatment which is then in a position to make statements about the original context. Masses, accumulation, speed, incongruence, simultaneity, density, chaos. These are all nouns describing the large city. They have always provided a stimulating and fertile soil for artists and writers. They inspired the creation of ever newer cityscapes. Masses of people, of stone, of images, of noise, of light and of atmosphere and their domestication by the means of collage or montage. As far back as already 1740, Giovanni Battista Piranesi had already searched for an artistic medium, a method of representation that would dominate these superimpositions, the simultaneity, mass, and density. His Antiquita di Roma and his Carcery are an expression of the entwinement of stone, history, and life co coexisting alongside one another. There are attempts to conquer 
the labyrinth of the city already in the 18th century. And uh, I stay with the 18th century. I already mentioned him. Uh, one uh, journalist who was already in the 1740s and 50s, a very modern journalist, the writer Louis Sébastien Mercier. He shows an equally modern medium uh, to characterize the metropolis of Paris. Uh, I mentioned uh, his book Tableau de Paris, which uh, appeared uh, in the uh, 1780s. Like a lighting technician, he allows beams of light to glide over the city. Mercier could be seen as the forefather of a series of big city writers, from Honoré de Balzac uh, to Eugène Sue to Charles Baudelaire, on to Léon Paul Fargue or Raymond Quenot, if we stay with the French literature. The viewer is not only impressed by the abundance of visual impressions, but also by the masses of people in their stimulating diversity. The people around me here, boy, it's Babylon, a melting pot of all races. That's how I would put it, elegant people wander through Central Park, charming, almost dried out silk mummies, brightly made up, colorful, endless. Sometimes you almost get dizzy. Yes, I find it exciting to depict this full life, wrote George Ross to Wieland Herzfelde in the 1920s. And Theodore Dreiser, also from, you know, uh, from New York, uh, <coughs> noted uh, in the 1920s as well, Already at 6 and 6.30 in the morning, they have begun to trickle small streams of human beings, Manhattan or city ward. And by 7 and 7, thank you, <laughs> by 7 and 7.15, these streams have become sizable affairs. By 7.30 and 8, they have changed into heavy, turbulent rivers, and by 8.15 and 8.30 and, uh, 8 and 9, they are raging torrents, no less. They overflow all the streets and avenues and every available means of conveyance. They are pouring into all available doorways, shops, factories, office buildings, those huge affairs towering so significantly above them. Or um, <clears throat> this uh, multitude aspect uh, interpreted uh, by Robert Musil. Motorcars came shooting out of deep, narrow streets into the shallow of bright squares. Dark patches of pedestrian bustle formed into cloudy streams, where stronger lines of speed transacted their loose woven hurrying. They clotted up only to trickle on all the faster, then and after a few ripples regain their regular pulse beat again. Hundreds of sounds were intertwined into a coil of wiry noise with single barbs projecting sharp edges running along it and submerging again and clear notes splintering off, flying and scattering. And to continue with uh, Musil, not Musil, Musil. should not make out of a German name an English pronounced one. Um, so another quotation of uh, Robert Mosil um, out of uh, his uh, book Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften. Cities can be recognized by their pace just as people can by their walk. So no special significance should be attached to the name of the city. Like all big cities, 
It consisted of irregularity, change, sliding forward, not keeping in step, collisions of things and affairs, and fathomless points of silence in between. This was my part of gentle reading. Of paved ways and wilderness, of one great rhythmic throb, and the perpetual discord of and dislocation of all opposing rhythms, and as a whole resembled a seething, bubbling fluid and a vessel consisting of the solid material of buildings. So here we are again uh, with uh, the material, um, uh, what uh, the cities are made of. Uh, of the solid material of buildings, laws, regulations, and historical traditions. Um, and uh, here I'm going to repeat again uh, two uh, of my combined tableaux, uh, the Vista bird's eye view of uh, Berlin and Paris, uh, to give you an idea of the density of important buildings in metropolitan cities, uh, and uh, Berlin and uh, Paris, and uh, the last uh, very short uh, idea that I try to uh, put onto the fore is titled uh, Standardize or Revitalize. Under the threat of economic dictatorship, cities are in danger to lose their contextual qualities. Happily, the drastic and provocative leveling imagined by Le Corbusier as negation of the historic city in the 1930s never became reality. A plea for the maintenance of the manifold qualities of metropolitan agglomerations does not mean to lock the existing city up in a glass bowl, but to save and further the narrative qualities uh, responsible decisions regarding the spatial, cultural, social, and historic context have to characterize the urban planning process and free it from the omnipresent property speculation as documented in the film Property Brahma, which was shown at the Chicago Architectural Biennale in uh, the last month in November. That's what it was all about. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Francisca, for this uh, great multifaceted uh, portrait or uh, ways of uh, reception of the cities as a, as a threat, as a montage, uh, as a gentle reading of the city. Um, I would maybe uh, only add that uh, as a, our point of departure you also mentioned was the text by Georg Simmel, Großstädte und das Geistesleben. And uh, Simmel has a sociological reading of the city, so he's actually stressing the technical uh, character of the of the city with as a as a seat of money economy exchange places of production he also opens up the idea of a clock that prevents chaos um, he also um, he's also defining a metropolitan type of a person um, and this metropolitan type of the person is actually um, um, yeah, uh, kind of immune to all of these different uh, impressions and stimuli of the of the major city. Uh, he's an uh, intellectual. Uh, the big city, as in contrast to the small city, is uh, of an intellectual character. And uh, Simmel also 
stresses some qualities for metropolitan inter integration and, and cohabitance, uh, which is for him the blasé attitude and reservedness. And I think in these, um, in these portraits, and, and also like the individual being overwhelmed by the masses, uh, and uh, by some kind of an objective culture which is much larger than the individual culture of this of this person. Like the individual is kind of lost in the city uh, and he wants to define himself, may, make himself appear more to the point, clear cut. Um, and this uh, this overwhelming impression of the of the metropolis leads to these eccentricisms like caprice, dandyism, um, ways of making oneself noticeable, and uh, I think this is something we uh, very much saw in these uh, early metropolitan portraits from the 1920s and 30s, uh, how the artists and, and journalists kind of recepted this uh, this large city um, as uh, as places for self self invention and. Um, but not only, because of, uh, it was also places for of of uh, of poverty, which actually Simmel, as a sociologist, doesn't doesn't really um, very much talk about. So here, it's actually the collision of the sociological reading of the city, which is uh, focused on some kind of a me mechanism and very. Um, very structured reading of society and the reading of the city through um, through artists, the eye of an artist, we, are, we uh, or an architect or, or a writer, who are more receptive to very individual and detailed uh, detailed aspects of the city, such as I don't know problem, problem, problems of the city, such as poverty or uh, these major differences between the rich and poor, etc., etc. Um, do you? Does anybody in the public have a have a different uh, a, an immediate que uh, question now? Because um, if uh, if not, maybe we would leave the discussion uh, for later. And uh, and we would follow up after like five minute break with a presentation by Daniel Schwartz, uh, who is a filmmaker. So I would give space for one or two like questions, really urgent questions, and uh, yeah, and then we would move on. Okay, good. So. Let me let yeah. me add something um, for those who are interested in the uh, topic, uh, how the narrators saw the big city. I have a very short uh, selected biography according to the topic: film, uh, uh, painting, literature, and uh, other titles. So. She she was so kind to make copies uh, for those who need some more information. So five minute break so that we can change the um, design and layout here of the space and then I'll ask Daniel. <laughs> 